Okay, thank you. Um, many thanks to the organizers for this opportunity. Um, this is based on, on this paper uh, that we wrote with Rachel uh, at Columbia. Uh, okay, so the subject of my talk is partially massless gravity, uh, which I'm assuming not everyone here or most people here are not familiar with. Uh, so I'm planning to spend a good fraction of my talk simply introducing the subject, okay? Uh, okay, so my starting point is a massive spin two field on a constant curvature background. So imagine splitting the metric into uh, a constant curvature background, which is either the sitter or anti the sitter, plus a fluctuation, which is our graviton. Okay. Uh, okay, so as we learned on Monday, uh, the free theory is described by the first Pauli action. The only new thing here is that instead of partial derivatives, we have covariant derivatives defined with respect to our background geometry. Uh, and we also have a curvature term that comes from linearizing the cosmological constant term in the Einstein-Hilbert action, okay? So this R bar is a constant, it's just the rich scalar of our background space, okay? And let me remind you that we also have a mass term now for a massive graviton, uh, which is given by, by this expression here, with m being the mass of the graviton. Uh, okay, uh, so we also learn about this Tuckelberg method, uh, which is a nice way to study the degrees of freedom of our theory, and also their stability. Uh, in particular for gravity, we take the, our tensor field and replace it with this expression. So we introduce a, a new vector field and also a new scalar field. And the only new thing here is that uh, we should use covariant derivatives rather than partial derivatives because our background is now curved, okay? Uh, so Rachel showed that there exists this relativistic limit which formally uh, amounts to taking the mass of the graviton to zero. And in this limit, uh, these three fields become the independent helicities of our massive graviton. Uh, so in particular, the tensor field becomes the helicities, helicities plus and minus two, the vector field becomes the helicities plus and minus one, and the scalar is just the longitudinal mode, the helicity zero, okay? Um, so for generic values of the rigid scalar of the background and the graviton mass, these helicities are all physical. Okay, they are all propagating degrees of freedom. Uh, and therefore, if you do the math, uh, you find that the theory has five degrees of freedom, uh, as you, you, you would expect for a massive graviton. Okay? Uh, and the theory is massive gravity. Okay, so this is, let me emphasize, this is for generic values of curvature and mass of the graviton. Uh, so what about the stability? So this is like a, a plot in the, in, theory space of massive gravity, so to speak. So the horizontal axis is the mass of the graviton and the vertical axis is the curvature of the background. So when you are in the upper half plane, this is the sitter with positive curvature and in the lower half plane is anti the sitter uh, with negative curvature. Um, so uh, it can be shown that the helicity plus and minus one mode of the graviton is stable provided that the mass of the graviton squared is positive. So that rules out this whole region on the left, okay? So, yeah, so in, in this region, the helicity one is unstable, it's a ghost, uh, and therefore you, you can rule out that region. Uh, the helicity zero is stable, provided that the mass squared of the graviton satisfies this inequality. Uh, this is called the Higuchi bound. Uh, and therefore, on this plot, this region here in blue is, is ruled out. So in this region, the helicity zero is unstable. It's a ghost, okay? So that, that gives you this white region here as the, uh, as the space of theories which are stable, okay? So note that these bounds are strict. So this is strictly greater, strictly greater. But you may ask, what happens when we saturate the bounds? And it turns out interesting things happen uh, because we get gauge symmetries when we, when we hit the bounds. Um, so in particular, when th this, is, this is well known, when the mass of the graviton is zero, 
uh, you know what you get? You get GR. That's the theory of a massless graviton, which has this diffeomorphism symmetry, uh, linearized diffeomorphism symmetry, because so far I'm dealing only with, with free theories. Uh, and this theory has two degrees of freedom rather than five. So when you are on this line here, m equals zero line, uh, your five degrees of freedom, some of them become unphysical, they become pure gauge, and you end up with two physical degrees of freedom corresponding to a massless graviton. Uh, perhaps more interesting is when you saturate the Higuchi bound, when m squared equals uh, one-sixth of the curvature radius. Uh, in this case, this, this corresponds to this line here, which, which node is in the, the Sitter half of our theory space. And this corresponds to this partially massless theory of gravity. Uh, and this has this curious gauge symmetry. Uh, it's, a, it's a scalar gauge symmetry because the, the gauge parameter in this case is a scalar. And it involves two derivatives in this case. Okay? So, so it's, kind of a, it, it's kind of curious in the sense that you have a massive field with a gauge symmetry living in the sitter. Okay? This is partially massless gravity. Uh, okay, so in a nutshell, the, the main properties of this theory, as I just said, uh, the graviton has a mass that is given by this value. It's a fraction, a specific fraction of the curvature uh, of the rigid scalar of the background, which can also be written in terms of the cosmological constant, like so. Uh, the theory has a scalar gauge symmetry, as I just said, um, which has two derivatives. Uh, and this gauge symmetry uh, removes the helicity zero mode of the graviton. So this is, this is a, a, a field, a spin two field that has four degrees of freedom. It has the helicity plus minus one and plus minus two, but not the longitudinal mode, okay? Okay, uh, so th those were the, 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 the main basic aspects of this theory, uh, but there are also some interesting phenomenological consequences uh, the first one, and probably the most interesting one, is the cosmological constant problem. So I just told you that the cosmological constant is related to the graviton mass uh, by this equation. So they are related by a order one numerical coefficient. And therefore, having a small cosmological constant is equivalent to having a small graviton mass. Uh, but this is great, because uh, having a small graviton mass is technically natural. Uh, the reason being that when the mass of the graviton is exactly zero, you know that you recover the diffeomorphism symmetry of GR. So it's, it's kind of when the, mass of the, uh, when the mass of the graviton is zero, you have more symmetry, so to speak. And that implies that uh, a small m square is technically natural. It does not receive large quantum corrections. So if you start with a small mass, then you know that that's going to be under control under quantum corrections. That's what we mean by technically natural, okay? Uh, a second interesting consequence is the fifth force problem. Uh, Rachel talked about this on Monday. Uh, this is the VDVZ discontinuity. Uh, and it, so, so as you learn, uh, in massive gravity, the helicity is zero mode. Uh, it remains coupled at short distances. It remains coupled to matter at short distances. So the Lagrangian looks roughly like this. This is what you would expect to see at short distances. We, we would expect to have GR at short distances. However, we have also this coupling between the, the, the longitudinal mode and the trace of the, stress on the, of the stress energy tensor. And this gives rise to a fifth force, which we don't observe, of course. Uh, uh, as we learned also, this is solved in nonlinear massive gravity by the Weinstein mechanism, uh, which consists of, of, the, of, the, of the sort of killing of this longitudinal mode at short distances by means of the nonlinearities of this field. So around a source, uh, say a star of mass m, the profile of the, of the field looks roughly like this. It goes like one over r, at large distances, but at short distances, it goes to zero as some power, okay? Uh, so this renders the, the, the field and the corresponding force unobservable. Uh, 
So the Weinstein mechanism is great because it solves this fifth force problem. However, there's a price to pay, which is uh, generically uh, perturbations in this nonlinear region are superluminal. This is not really a theorem, but it's kind of a very generic property uh, of this Weinstein mechanism, okay? Uh, but the good thing of partially massless gravity is that we never have to worry about this because we just don't have this longitudinal mode, okay? So that's great. Um, we never have to really worry about this issue of having superluminality uh, in the nonlinear regime. Okay. Um, I'll, let me skip the details here. There are also some nice analogies with electromagnetism. Uh, so for example, you can write the partially massless action like in Maxwell-like form, F squared. Uh, so if you define this tensor F as the anti-symmetric derivative of H, uh, then the action can be written as F squared, roughly speaking. And this F is, a, is an invariant field strength, just like the F mu nu of electromagnetism. It, it is invariant under the, the gauge symmetry of partially massless. Um, and there's also a duality invariance. If you go to Hamiltonian formalism, you can define a sort of E and B fields in terms of which the action has this duality invariance, pretty much like in, in, in E and M. Okay, so, so far I've been telling you about the free theory. Um, so the action that I wrote down was just the quadratic action. Uh, but the question, the obvious question is whether there is a nonlinear theory of partially massless gravity. That is, can we add to our quadratic action that we know, can we add higher order interactions to this field? Well, this is a gauge symmetry, so we should also expect to have nonlinear corrections to our gauge symmetry, like it happens in Young Mills, for example. Uh, so this delta zero H is the gauge symmetry that we know, the, the one that corresponds to the quadratic action, but we, in principle, should expect to have higher order corrections to this symmetry, okay? So note that this, this lowest order symmetry does not involve any powers of H on the right-hand side, but in principle, we could have a gauge symmetry that involves the field itself, like in Young Mills, for example, or GR. Okay, uh, so unfortunately, so far we only have negative results. Uh, so first, it was shown that this, this nonlinear theory of partially massless gravity cannot belong to the DRGT class of ghost free massive gravity. Uh, that's one thing. More generally, even if you don't worry about ghosts, it was shown that you can, you can make a very generic, very general ansatz, so assume that the kinetic Lagrangian is Einstein-Hilbert, and add just any potential that you want. And it was shown that uh, a theory of this class cannot have this partially massless symmetry at nonlinear order. Uh, and even more generally, it was shown that even if you relax the assumption about the kinetic terms, so the only constraint being now that the action has two derivatives, uh, it was shown that partially massless gravity cannot have this form uh, at the nonlinear order, okay? So these are very, uh, these are very general no-go results if you think about it because the only assumption here is that the action has at most two derivatives. So imagine writing anything you want with up to two derivatives. The claim is that uh, that's not going to have the partially massless symmetry at nonlinear order. Okay, uh, so the method here, the method we use to prove this uh, is based on this closure condition on gauge symmetries, which is kind of, is, is kind of a nice method because uh, it doesn't make any assumption about the form of the action. That's why it's so general in a sense. Uh, it, it only relies on the form of the symmetry. So just to explain the method quickly, uh, let, me, let me do the spin one example. So the starting point here is the Maxwell action, which you know has this usual gauge symmetry. And we look for nonlinear extensions of this symmetry. So we write in, generically, we can write a, a nonlinear gauge symmetry in this way, where this beta and alpha are the functions that we want to determine. So beta is some 
arbitrary function of powers of the field, and alpha likewise involves one derivative and powers of the field, like so. And our goal is to determine this, this, this symmetry, okay? Uh, and here the, the method is based on this closure condition that the commutator of two gauge transformations has to, it has to be itself a gauge transformation. That's kind of an integrability condition for a gauge symmetry, and it follows from Frobenius theorem. Uh, okay, so the goal is to solve this equation for our unknown functions alpha and beta, uh, and skipping all the algebra, the result turns out to be just the trivial one. Beta has to be just the Kronecker delta, and alpha has to be zero, and as a result, the most general gauge symmetry for a single spin one field turns out to be just the usual Maxwell symmetry, this one. Uh, and as a consequence, uh, this tells you that the most general low energy action that you can write down for a spin one field is just the Maxwell action. There's nothing else you can write down, okay? And this, is, and this all follows from this closure condition on the gauge symmetry. Uh, you can play the same game with, the, with multiple spin one fields. Let me skip the details here. It turns out that you can derive Young Mills using this method. Um, right, so this is the result. If you apply the closure condition to multiple spin ones, you find the Young Mills uh, gauge symmetry, and therefore, uh, and as a result, you, you get that at low energies, the action has to be the Young Mills theory. Uh, a third example is the spin two, a massless spin two in this case, which has linearized diffeomorphisms as a symmetry. And playing the same game, you turn the crank, it turns out that you can derive GR. So in this case, you find that the most general gauge symmetry for a massless spin two field turns out to be nonlinear diffeomorphisms. So you can derive GR using this method, starting from the free action of a spin two field. Uh, and this is kind of nice because in, the, in, the, in our starting point, in the linearized action, there's no reference to manifolds and geometry. So it's kind, of, it's, it's kind of similar to the desert construction that Rachel described on Monday, uh, in which this geometric picture of GR sort of emerges as a consequence rather than as, as an assumption, okay? Uh, so this is the result for a master spin two case. And again, at low energies, this symmetry implies that the action has to be Einstein-Hilbert. So you can derive Maxwell theory, you can derive Young-Mills, you can derive uh, GR using this method of the closure condition. Okay, so just to, just to, just to finish here, uh, what we did with Rachel was to apply this closure condition to partially massless. So our starting point is the quadratic partially massless action, uh, which has this lowest order symmetry. And in this case, the, the general form of the nonlinear symmetry now involves three unknown functions because it has two derivatives, so it's, it's a bit more complicated. Uh, but nevertheless, you turn the crank and you can show that the general result turns out to be this for these unknown functions, B, D, and C. And let me remind you, this F tensor is the Maxwell-like tensor for partially massless, this anti-symmetric derivative. Uh, so this is the punchline. The most general gauge symmetry for a partially massless spin two turns out to be this. This is the lowest order one, corresponding to the quadratic action, and we found this unique nonlinear extension that involves this tensor F. So this is quadratic in the fields. And uh, let me point out this, just to remind you, this phi is the gauge function, it's a scalar, and this gamma is just a, an arbitrary constant. Okay, so this was the symmetry. What about the action? So I've been selling you this method because, it, because you, 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 you don't make any assumptions of, about the form of the action, so it's kind of super general. You only rely on the symmetries, and you don't make any assumptions about the action. But at the end of the day, you obviously want the action, right? Uh, so to find the action, what, what, what you can use is the Netter identity. So let me remind you that if you have a gauge symmetry, there exists a corresponding Netter identity. Uh, which in GR, this is just the Bianchi identity. So if you have diffeomorphisms, you know that you can derive the Bianchi identity like this. And in general, Netter identities are always of the form differential operator hitting the equation of motion equals zero. 
this is always the case. Uh, for partially massless, uh, you, the, the letter identity gives you this mess here. Uh, again, this F is this anti-symmetric combination, and E3 is the cubic part of the equation of motion. This is what we are after. Remember, we are trying to find nonlinear extensions for partially massless gravity. We have the quadratic equation of motion that's known, and we're trying to find nonlinear interactions. Uh, so this is what we are after. Uh, and the result turns out to be there's no solution. If you stick to actions with two derivatives, it turns out that uh, there's no solution for the, for the equation of motion at cubic order. So that's our no-go result. Uh, yeah, bummer. OK, just to wrap up in one minute. Uh, so I told you about partially massless gravity. This is a theory of a massive graviton that lives on the sitter uh, and enjoys a gauge symmetry, a scalar gauge symmetry. Uh, I told you about the free theory because that's the only thing that is known so far. Uh, the obvious question is whether there is an interacting theory. And I hope I convince you that this is a well-motivated question. Uh, but we have these very general no-go results that any nonlinear extensions must necessarily have more than two derivatives. Uh, so some future prospects, well, one obvious one that follows from this is that whether there could be higher order derivatives interactions. Uh, second, you could consider coupling to other fields. So far, I only consider a single partially massless field. But you can consider, you can imagine coupling this field to, say, a massless graviton or to other partially massless fields and so on. And finally, uh, I didn't talk about this, but it turns out that these partially massless fields exist for any higher spin, for any spin greater or equal than two. So you can imagine playing this same game for higher spin fields and see whether you can get interactions for these fields. Uh, that's it, thank you.